stuff for our goals get sucked up with it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the type of vacuum we're talking about doesn't really have anything in similar to that. So we you move your hand through the air, right? The air comes through and it fills in behind your hand. There's not a lack of molecules behind your hand, right? You don't create a, a very strong vacuum behind your hand. And that's because the air around us is at such a high pressure that the air is behaving in something called fluid flow. It's behaving like a fluid, just like water does, right? Put your hand in water, you move your hand through the water, the water's gonna fill in behind your hand, the air is doing the same thing. The type of vacuum we tend to use in the lab though, like in the electron microscope, in the reactor, in the sputter coater, that's called molecular flow. So molecular flow is, flow is I'm gonna draw two chambers here, they're gonna be perfect spheres. You got one chamber right here, this one's gonna have a, a lot of air molecules in it, okay, this is gonna be kind of atmospheric pressure. And then we're gonna have another chamber over here. We're gonna say this is the reactor, okay? And there's very few air molecules in the reactor. Um, in reality, uh, the difference between these is uh, going to be nine orders of magnitude in, in number of air molecules. So uh, you would divide number of air molecules in here uh, by nine followed by eight zeros. Um, so a big difference. In this, in this case, the air molecules, when they are traveling through the vacuum, they're more likely to collide with each other than they are to collide with the walls of the chamber and that's why it's fluid flow. The air molecules are flowing around, they're bouncing against each other, and they're forcing each other to fill in the gaps and everything. In the type of vacuum in the reactor, we have what's called molecular flow, where the air molecules, there's so few of them, the, the, the mean free path of the air molecules is so long that they are significantly more likely, uh, by multiple orders of magnitude, to be hitting the walls of the chamber instead of hitting each other. So we can't model these types, we can't model this type of vacuum as a fluid like we can normal air. It's a molecular, uh, it, it's a molecular environment and we model it as a bunch of individual particles. And um, the fact that we have to at some point transition from the fluid flow to molecular flow is kind of the basis of, of how all the vacuum pumps we have that work, how all the confide that seals that works, why we have to have things so tightly sealed with so little dust and everything. It's all because of this molecular flow. So I'm going to introduce you to a set of units. Uh, this unit is TOR, uh, T-O-R-R, -R, and that's a unit of pressure. Um, atmospheric pressure, uh, so atmospheric pressure is uh, 760 TOR, okay? Um, and that, you know, varies a little bit depending on where you are, you know, how close you are to sea level, what the barometric pressure is that day. The 760 TOR is, is, is generally what atmospheric pressure is. Um, now, remember when I said that there was, you know, like nine orders of magnitude difference between uh, atmosphere pressure and where the, the reactor, the electron microscope runs? We don't ever write that as, you know, 0 0.0000000001 because that's exhausting. Uh, so when we refer to TOR, we're normally referring to in scientific notation. Uh, so the reactor, so the electron microscope vacuum would usually be at a 10 to the, uh, I screwed that one up. Uh, will be like uh, 3 times 10 to the negative 6 tor. So that's the, that's the notation you're going to see the reactor's pressure in, or the, the SEM's pressure in. And so when we're saying, you know, oh yeah, the microscope needs to be in the negative 6s, or the reactor needs to be in the negative 3s, we're referring to the order of magnitude of tor. And that's a really, really common thing to hear. Uh, to give you a sense of kind of where these different levels are, um, the vac a vacuum cleaner, okay? Uh, we'll pull somewhere between 500 and 300 tor. So, you know, we're not even into the negative range yet, right? Um, the rotary pump that, uh, remember how I was talking about on the, on the uh, reactor, how there's two pumps, and I'll get more into that later. The rotary pump will get into the, about the negative three tors. The chamber on the reactor can get to about negative five, negative, negative six tors. The chamber on the SCM, when it's absolutely perfect, can get to about the negative seven tors. Uh, the uh, best vacuum chambers we have on Earth, like the, the biggest, most expensive, most time put into it with millions of dollars of vacuum pumps on them, can get to somewhere between the negative 13, negative 14 tours. Um, and then outer space, uh, it goes up from there. Like, we, we cannot on Earth achieve a vacuum as good as deep space. So deep space is like negative 15 tour and beyond. Okay, so um, to put a couple of names to this, um, anything... Uh, so anything in the negative threes, okay, uh, that's going to be considered a low vacuum. So low vac. Anything uh, in between the negative threes, 
uh, to the negative, dash doesn't make sense here, but whatever, uh, to the negative, what is it, negative sevens, um, to the negative sevens is going to be high vacuum. And then anything in between the negative eights to the negative about 10 to 11 range, it kind of varies depending on what you're doing. Uh, we'll say negative 10 is uh, going to be very high vacuum um, or ex Ultra? Uh, extreme high vacuum, not quite yet. Okay. Um, we're very creative in naming these things as you can tell. And then anything beyond negative 10, so negative 11 and over is ultra high vacuum. So uh, UHV is how it's abbreviated. Try to run W there for a second. Okay, so when we say you know low vac, you got a little tiny pump on it, you'll get down to that low vacuum in about eh, 30 seconds to two to three minutes is usually what it takes to get to low vacuum. Uh, high vacuum uh, can take anywhere from uh, that five, 10 minute mark all the way to two days to pump down to the negative seven range. Uh, very high vacuum can take uh, two to three days, but at that point you're literally heating the entire chamber up really hot and we'll get to why that happens in a bit. And then ultra high vacuum can take days or weeks to get to. Or extreme, or uh, yeah, ultra high. And um, you'll even, you'll, sometimes you see it as ultra high or extreme ultra high or something like that. Um, people for marketing reasons like to, you know, add more letters to their vacuum pumps because it makes them sound more impressive. Good for you, right? Um, does everyone have that? Because these are a good range to understand, yeah? The vacuum pump that I would use at school, Yeah. what would that That's You're going to be very range? solidly in the low vacuum range. There's going to be somewhere between the uh, the, the uh, 10, to the, 10 to the 0 or 10 to the negative 2-ish, probably. Um, that's, uh, so yeah, you're, you're you know, you're you're going to need a decimal, maybe, uh, but it's not nearly the same level of vacuum that you're going to get to um, inside of the reactor or something like that. Um, so everyone's got this. So when I say, you know, we're getting to ultra high vacuum, you understand how hard that is now, um, and how like we're, we are now approaching deep space. Um, like even low Earth orbit is in the um, uh, depending on you know exactly where you are is in the um, high, very high or ultra high range. And that's st there's still like considered some atmosphere up there, so like space is an impressively good vacuum. <laughs> uh, I, I can't I can't stress that enough. Like we if we could get to a vacuum that we can achieve that space is on Earth, it would make so many things so much simpler. Um, so let's talk about how we get to that level of vacuum. Okay, uh, the first type of pump we're going to talk about is a rotary pump. This rotary pump is kind of the uh, gets you from atmospheric range to the low to just entering high um, um, high vacuum range. Okay. So the rotary pump, it's got a, um, it's got a piece that spins in the center. That's why it's a rotary pump. Uh, and this piece that spins in the center has got these uh, notches in it. And these notches, there's these thing called, there's these thing called veins. And these veins are uh, rectangular blocks of material. And they can slide back and forth within this groove in the inside of this piece. So this, this piece right here is spinning, okay? Uh, I think I drew, nope, spins the other way. So this piece right here is spinning. And what we have around this is um, another kind of circular shaped cavity, but that circular shaped cavity isn't mounted center to the pump, it's mounted offset. And so um, on one side we've got a, uh, so like on here we'll have a, um, an output, so this is where the air molecules come out, and then over here we'll have an input. So this is where the air molecules go in. Um, actually, those need to be 180 degrees apart from each other. Uh, so air molecules will uh, come out over here. So we've got uh, molecules coming in, molecules coming out. So what happens is, is as this thing turns, the volume trapped by the veins changes. Okay. So as we, as the pump head moves over here. Is that uh, with both the with both the veins vertical, you've got a really large volume right here, okay? And then as the pump continues to turn, so we do 180 degree. Now the air molecules that came in over here and got trapped got forced along by these veins rubbing against the walls of the of, of the pump, 
get forced along, and it compresses them down because the volume shrinks, right? PV equals NRT as the volume shrinks, the pressure increases. So the pressure increases, and then we can exhaust them out. And then the pump spins around again, and now that we've exhausted all those molecules out, the volume expands again, we can suck more molecules into it, and we just repeat that. So the pump keeps spinning and spinning and pulling the vacuum. Um, so you'll hear this referred to as a rotary vacuum pump. Uh, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the roughing pump or the backing pump. Um, and the reason it's called the roughing pump or the backing pump is when it's, when it's roughing, it is for like the reactor. Uh, when you start the reactor up, you turn, this, you turn the rotary pump on in the back, and you use the rotary pump to rough down the chamber. So you connect the rotary pump to the chamber, it takes the chamber from 760 torr down to the, kind of that, low, that low vacuum range. Um, and that's how we're starting out. Um, so that's roughing the chamber down. And so the next type of pump we need is, this, is this, this type of pump will not take us into the high vacuum range. Um, it just isn't fast enough to do it, and it, um, the oil inside of it, when it gets to that level of vacuum, it starts to become vaporized and contaminates the vacuum. Um, so yeah, this, this, this type of thing will never get you, to, will never get you to, the, to the really high vacuum range at all. Uh, so the next type of pump we need is a molecular pump. So this one's taking us from the fluid flow regime, and it's just entered us into molecular flow. And now that we're in molecular flow, we can use molecular pumping technologies. And there's a lot of different types of molecular pumps. Uh, there's ones that spin, there's ones that use boiling oil, there's ones that, that use really big magnets, there's ones that use high voltage, and there's ones that literally just sit there and react with the molecules in the vacuum to suck them out of the chamber. Um, so we'll move kind of down that chain in order of um, ones that will achieve like high vacuum to you know medium high vacuum, very high, and uh, ultra high. So we're going to start with the oil diffusion pump. Uh, it uses boiling oil to pull a high vacuum, and that's what we have on the reactor. Uh, so the oil diffusion pump, it's got a, uh, a, a large kind of cylinder connected up to the chamber. This is the chamber up here. And then uh, this over here is going to be our output from the oil diffusion pump, okay? And so this output would be connected to a rotary pump like this. Now inside of this oil diffusion pump, we've got some oil in the base of it. Um, and then we have what's kind of uh, colloquially referred to as the Christmas tree. Um, so the Christmas tree is a oil jet system. Um, so we've got our inner jet with a cap on it. Our next jet has also got a cap on it. And this is a, um, these are both cross-section views of the pumps, by the way. So this is, this is what it would look like if you cut the pump in half. Uh, and then we got another jet here. And so what happens is uh, you pull the chamber down with the rotary pump, you are now in molecular flow, rotary pump's not pumping down anymore, your pressure's no longer dropping, we gotta turn this thing on. So turn this thing on, we apply heat to the bottom of it. Uh, once we apply heat, the oil starts boiling, um, which seems kind of intuitive, right? We're sending boiling oil vapors into the vacuum chamber we want to pump down to high vacuum. Uh, but what happens is these, these boiling oil vapors uh, uh, get accelerated up all these different parts of the pump, okay? And then when they when they reach uh, the piece the uh, when they reach the caps at the top of each of these different uh, parts of the pump, the vapor then gets accelerated downwards, and so we got all this oil vapor shooting out at supersonic velocities inside of this thing, um, and so it, it's the oil vapor shooting down, hitting the walls of the pump, and condensing back down and, and flowing through this again. So what happens is is when an air molecule uh, comes by and flows into the pump. The air molecule physically gets hit by the oil vapor, and the oil vapor pushes the air molecules into the base of the pump. Uh, so that's how boiling oil, when directed in the right way, can pump a chamber down uh, orders of magnitude more so uh, than one of these rotary pumps can. And that's a, and that's what a molecular pump does, or what a, uh, what this kind of classification molecular pump does. It, it, it physically hits the molecules of air with something to force them into the bottom of the pump. So, um, I should mention this at the beginning. If you have a question, feel free to ask any time. I'm drawing on a whiteboard so I can, you know, adapt the lecture to whatever you guys are curious about when we're doing this. So, any questions before I erase all of this? Yeah? Does the heat have to be continuous? If it cools, then you're going to end up the air coming back out of the oil? Uh, so, the air doesn't get stuck in the oil. Uh, what happens is, is the air molecules get forced gradually down the pump, and then they end up at a higher concentration down here of air molecules. And so then this, so then the rotary pump sucks them up from from below it. But yeah, if the pump does cool down, you the oil stops flowing, and so over time, uh, because this is a slightly higher pressure than up here, the air molecules will kind of slowly flow back up, uh, up through it. 
but uh, the pump, there, there is, air molecules are moving out of the pipe and moving into the rotary pump and being exhausted out the entire time. Um, so, any more questions about the diffusion pump before we move on to the next type of pump? Cool. So the next type of pump is another one that spins, um, but it spins faster than some computer hard drives do. Uh, it's called a turbo molecular pump, and these ones are, uh, are kind of cool. Um, they are the closest thing we have that pretty much just beats the vacuum into submission, um, and it does that at very high velocities. So the turbo molecular pump looks a lot like a diffusion pump uh, from the get-go. It's got that, um, that kind of characteristic, you know, large cylindrical chamber, and once again we've got our roughing line, or our backing line. The reason that rotary pumps are sometimes called back backing pumps is you use them to back a high backing pump. Uh, vacuum like I'm at the bottom, so once again we're going to eventually get a high vacuum on top and a low vacuum on the bottom of the pump. And instead of the oil vapor this time, we have a spinning rotor. This thing looks like a jet engine from the top, okay? Um, so we've got a bunch of blades. And we've got some fixed blades on the side here, and there's a, a rotor that goes down the center. <coughs> and I'm not going to draw all these because there's a lot of stages on these pumps normally. Um, so... Kind of struggling here, but that's okay. Uh, so we've got these larger rotors kind of moving towards smaller rotors, and it just continues down the entire length of the pump. And so what happens is, this thing looks like a fan blade, except this fan blade spins at 10,000 RPMs. Okay, uh, your computer's hard drive probably spins between five and 7,000 RPMs. Your car engine spins at you know two to 3,000 RPMs when you're really revving it up. Uh, so 10,000 RPMs for a large chunk of steel with a bunch of blades on it is kind of terrifying. Um, when they crash, uh, that much steel moving is enough force to actually shear the bolts mounting this pump on, and so the pump can go flying off to the side and put a hole inside of, inside of whatever vacuum machine you're running. Um, I've seen a microscope, like kind of like ours, that had one of these thermoelectric pumps on it. Thermoelectric pump crashed, and this thing was spinning so fast and had so much energy, it tore the pump off of its mounts, sent it, twisted it 90 degrees, and pushed out the steel panels on the side of the microscope. That's how much energy it takes to pump these to pump this level of vacuum. But these, uh, these blades are, um, they're all at different angles. So at the top here, they're at a very steep angle. And then as we move down the pump, the angle of the blade gets flatter and flatter. And so what's happening is that uh, when an air molecule comes in and uh, it kind of flows down into the pump and the blade spins around and hits the air molecule, uh, because we're you know, hitting an object with a 45 degree blade, it knocks the object downwards. This isn't like a fan in your, this isn't like a fan in your, like that fan, like that fan, you know, it's, kind of slowly moving through the air, and it's pushing the fluid air down. No, this one is coming and slamming into it at high velocity and imparting kinetic energy on the air molecules to force them down into the pump. And then the reason we have shallower and shallower blades is that as you force more air molecules into the base of the pump, the pressure, uh, the pressure gradient in the pump goes up, so you don't want to be hitting them with that steep of an angle anymore, so you make the blade shallower. And then eventually you have um, you go from like a vacuum of like, uh, up to like 10 to the negative 9 or, or negative 8 up here, down to a vacuum of 10 to the negative 3 in the base of the pump. Um, so that's a, you know, another molecular pump. I think you can see the similarities between the diffusion pump and the turbo molecular pump, right? Except uh, this one's a lot cleaner because it doesn't have boiling oil. Um, and these things are also kind of weird. Uh, you have to have really, really amazing bearings to run something at, you know, 10,000 RPMs. Like the bearings you have in your fidget spinner aren't going to do for this. Uh, oftentimes there is uh, active magnetic levitation, so you've got these magnetic coils that sit on top of the pump, and the controller is literally like using the magnets to balance this rotor, so it's not even touching anything because it's spinning so fast. Uh, so yeah, these, these pumps are kind of fun, but um, they, they're very expensive because they're good, and they also, uh, if they're mistreated, have the tendency to uh, catastrophically destroy themselves in spectacular fashion. Um, I wish I had a dead pump with me. Uh, they are actually kind of cool inside when they've died. Um, these things are so low friction that when they're not dead, you can just spin the housing of the pump around, like on a table, and then the rotor in the center just stays still. Question or, yeah? Um, how big is, how big is the motor for this? Uh, that varies. Uh, the the motor is actually kind of uh, built into the walls of the pump um, because you just, there's no sh the, you, you don't have a really good physical way of connecting to it because you know things magnetically levitated. So you build the motor in between the, the fan blades in certain places. Um, there's a lot more complex. There's like the, I didn't draw the bottom of the pump because it gets really complicated down there, and that's like an hour-long lecture that's on its own. Not 
Um, but we can, we, I, can, I can pull up a cross-section of one of these pumps for you later and show you kind of where the windings are. Uh, they're, they're really cool, and there's a lot of really clever math that goes into making them function the way they do. So now we've, now we've uh, taken, you know, from our rotary pump, uh, getting down to like negative three tours. Now we've gotten up to negative eights, negative nines, if you're really lucky, okay? Um, in some cases, we still need to go further. And when we need to go further, that's when we get into um, getter pumps or ion pumps. And uh, you, the thing to keep in mind when we get to this point is that there is now, when we're at you know, negative 11 tor, or we're, for, let's say we're trying to get to negative 11 tor, there is going to be a difference of um, 14 orders of magnitude between atmospheric pressure and where we're now operating at. So the rules of where we're operating at are going to kind of change. Um, and the type of pumps we can start to use gets really interesting. Um, so once again, we're going to have our chamber here, okay? Chamber on top. And somewhere else in this chamber, there's a turbine molecular pump that's pulled this chamber down pretty low already. And now we're just going to have this kind of like this, this box. And this isn't like a cylinder anymore. This is just a box of metal. And in this box of metal, there's going to be a titanium plate on each side. And then in the middle of this, uh, there's going to be a bunch of tubes, okay? And these tubes are open at the end. I'm just not thinking how to draw that because that would take a really long time. And all these tubes are wired together. And then at the bottom of the pump, there's a high voltage feed through, okay? And we're going to apply a voltage like a 7 kV to this. Um, cannot write upside down backwards very well. 7 kV. Um, and when we apply that high voltage to this, the remaining air molecules in here get ionized. Uh, right, so we, we strip electrons off of them, uh, and when we because you know negative electrons attract to the positive potential of the pump, so we strip the electrons off. And when we do that, now we've got these charged particles that want to move towards ground. So the particles already kind of want to move in the direction of these titanium plates that are grounded to the outside of the pump, right? Because uh, something that's got a really high potential wants to move towards the lower potential, right? In this case, the lower potential is the walls of the pump. Uh, so we're going to get a few molecules accelerate towards the pump. That's not quite enough uh, to do what we want to do here. So what we do is we strap really massive magnets to the outside of this pump. And these magnets can weigh like between 20 and 150 pounds each. So really, really massive magnets are bolted to the outside of this pump. And what these magnets do is they cause these ions that get ionized inside of these pumps, right, that are just kind of casually traveling towards the outside, they cause the ions to spin around in a helical pattern. Uh, and that seems kind of weird, um, and we can get into the why that happens later, but it's due to the, uh, if you ever heard of the right hand rule in physics, um, when a charged particle moves through a magnetic field, it has a tendency to spin. Um, it's called spin precession, we'll get into it later. Uh, but trust me, they spin, and when they spin, these, charged, mo uh, these, these uh, charged particles will collide with more molecules in the vacuum and also ionize those. So now we've got a kind of a cascade of these spinning really fast molecules traveling. And what we do then is we slam these molecules into the titanium plates. Now titanium is a relatively reactive metal. So the individual air molecules in the pump get slammed into these plates at such a high velocity that they chemically react with the plates, thus getting stuck in the plate, thus being removed from the vacuum. So there is no exhaust on this, right? There's no, there's no roughing pump this system needs. It is, there's so little air at this point <coughs> that we can just absorb the remaining air molecules into the sheets of metal inside of the pump. Uh, so that's why it's called a getter pump, is because the metal is gathering up all of these molecules. Which is kind of a weird concept, right? You've got just a chunk of metal absorbing the air molecules. And that's why I stressed at the beginning that there is 14 orders of magnitude difference between atmospheric pressure and where these pumps are running at. Because they're, it's hard to comprehend how little air there is to be able to make this happen. This, is, this would be like if you had a piece of metal in, in the room, and it was rusting, right? And when, when, when let's say when iron rusts, it, form, it, it forms iron oxide. So the iron is taking oxygen out of the air. This is like doing that, except it's actually removing so much stuff from there that is uh, noticeably changing the pressure inside of the vessel. Uh, so that's called an ion getter pump uh, because it's using ions to get the materials. And you'll, you'll hear that abbreviated as an IGP sometimes. Um, so any questions about ion pumps? Okay, cool. We're going to talk about um, one more type of getter pump, and this is um, this this final type of getter pump is kind of the uh, one of the best types of pumps we have for really really crazy ranges. Uh, this is what the uh, Large Hadron Collider at CERN uses to pump down the, its its beam line where it sends the protons around in the big circle. 
Um, and this one's really complicated, okay, you ready for this? So we got the chamber, and then we just stack pieces of metal up in the chamber. Um, crazy, right? There's just chunks of metal sitting inside the chamber. And these things are called non-evaporable getters. And what these pieces of metal are is they're very specific alloys that when heated up to a certain point, all of the air molecules drive off them. So we do actually have a little heater cartridge kind of in between these, and you'll have kind of a lot of these in the chamber. Uh, so this heater cartridge heats these things up to 400. When, once you've you know pulled the system down using your big ion pumps, um, it uh, you pull the system down using the big ion pumps, you're able to heat these things up, drive off all the gas molecules from them, and then they're just effectively pieces of iron sitting in the middle of the chamber that don't have any oxygen on them, don't have any nitrogen on them, don't have any chemicals on them. And so when an air molecule comes and touches it, it reacts to the surface of it and gets stuck, and that's it. And so the air molecules just touch these things and they just get absorbed by it. Uh, so you think of when we're in a molecular flow environment, like or, uh, uh, a very high vacuum or, an or ultra extreme high vacuum, um, they're just all the air molecules just get stuck to the metal, um, and that is how we get to the crazy, ridiculous high vacuums we need to do certain experiments, like the Large Hadron Collider or uh, special types of special types of electron guns, or when we need to simulate outer space, or when we need to have the cleanest environment possible to do science. Uh, use pumps like this that just all of the air just sticks to them. Um, so yeah, as a molecular flow is weird, it takes a little bit of time to get used to, you know, thinking about. Um, so I'm just going to draw out an example of kind of how, or one of the ways molecular flow works. And we're going to draw two chambers here, okay? So I've got uh, one chamber over here. And I've got atmospheric pressure in this chamber, okay? So a bunch of air molecules. And I've got a tube here. And this tube's kind of skinny. And then I got another chamber over here, and for the sake of this demonstration, because I'm drawing on a whiteboard, I can say that, that is a perfect vacuum. Uh, you can't say that in real life, you never have a per perfect vacuum, but for the sake of demonstration, perfect vacuum. So, what is, I got all the air molecules in here, atmospheric pressure, 760 torr, what's going to happen to these air molecules? Okay, vacuum over here. System starts, what happens? Anybody? Yeah? Air rushes in the flood. Air rushes in the flood, it, and rushes is a really good description of it, right? This is that atmospheric pressure. These air molecules are bouncing against each other. They're pushing against each other. They're pushing the walls of the chamber. And so they all go very, very, very quickly down this tube, okay? And um, that's fluid flow. The fluid is being pushed by the pressure of itself down the tube really quickly. So let's do, this, let's do, let's do a different demonstration now, okay? We're gonna go to molecular flow. So once again, we're gonna have perfect imaginary vacuum that we can only really have on a whiteboard. And we're going to have 10 to the negative 6 torr pressure in here. So we're going to have a few air molecules that are going to be bouncing around, but it's, it's really empty. These air molecules are almost never touching each other. They're just bouncing off the walls of the chamber. So, system starts, what happens? What's, what are these air molecules over here going to do? Anyone? Yeah? Uh, so basically they're just, they're basically going to act like light, I guess. I, I don't know. Yeah, no, they are going to kind of act like light. You can, you can kind of think of these as rays. So we'll, we'll model just one air molecule. This air molecule is kind of traveling up here. It's going to bounce off the chamber here. It's going to bounce off the chamber here. And then it's just going to kind of slowly bounce down this pipe, okay? And then it'll eventually get to the end, right? But this, because it's, there's no other air molecules around here to force it, um, it's just bouncing off the surface of the chamber. And that's molecular flow. And so the, the, what, what this is called is it's called conductance, okay? Um, the conductance of a small tube is lower than the conductance of a big tube, right? If I had a very large tube connecting these two chambers instead of that really small one, um, you can imagine that all of these individual molecules of air are going to have a significantly easier time traveling down this tube a lot faster, and that a lot more of them are going to probabilistically, you know, enter this tube and go down this chamber. So in molecular flow, when you're designing a molecular flow system, you have to keep conductance in mind. Um, just because you have the world's largest pump, the world's fastest pump that can, that can achieve a perfect vacuum on one end of a system, and you've got a tiny little copper tube connecting it to the rest of the, rest of the system, that chamber will never pump down because of the conductance. That, that little tube, only so many molecules will enter it, and yeah, once they enter the tube and get out of the tube and enter the pump, they're going to be gone immediately. But until they get to that point, they're just going to kind of sit there. Um, so that's why in high vacuum systems, the, uh, the size of the chambers, the size of the pipes leading to the pumps, the size of the pipes leading to your gauges and your instrumentation, that all can locally affect the pressure, right? 
because per we, st we, got, we got that perfect vacuum over here, but we're still gonna have that relatively high pressure over here because the air molecules just don't move that fastly through the system. So any questions, any questions on conductance? Yeah? Uh, do, do people shape the system explicitly to maximize conductance, like use funnels and stuff? So a funnel actually wouldn't really maximize conductance uh, because uh, if I have a funnel connected to a small tube, um, yeah, the air molecules are bounced through the funnel, right? But they're still going to hit the small tube eventually. So when you want to maximize conductance, you just make it the largest diameter you possibly can. And yes, absolutely, conductance has to constantly be considered. Um, it, w without thinking it, without, if you don't think about conductance and you have, you know, tiny little orifice above your really fancy turbomolecular pump, right? Your, your chamber's not going to pump down very fast. And we actually, we, we take advantage of this a lot in the reactor. Um, if you, when, when I started the reactor last time, um, I know I've, I've rushed through the vacuum system on the reactor last time, or la last time because I, I wanted to get to just how to do the conflat, and now we're going back and doing the vacuum. Uh, the diff on the diffusion pump, we closed the diffusion pump valve most of the way to make a really small little crack above it. And that was to lower, that was actually intentionally lower the conductance so I could feed less gas into the reactor to ignite that plasma and maintain the pressure. If I have that valve open all the way, I have to feed a bunch of gas into the reactor to, to get the plasma to ignite inside of it. Um, Let's see here. Anybody have the time? I, don't, I can't see any clocks. Seven fifty-one. Seven fifty-one. Okay, perfect. Um, so the, the two the, yeah? um, prior to that, the titanium plate and mm -hmm. the metals. Do those have to be replaced frequently, or do they get recharged? Not frequently. Um, that you you can recharge them by baking them out. So you heat them up, and the air molecule, and some of the air molecules in them get driven off. And so you, you when you when you bake them out, what you do is you connect like a turbo a turbo molecular pump to the ion pump. You literally just like bolt the two of them together and you heat the ion pump up to like 400 degrees Celsius and, it, uh, and a lot of the air molecules drive out of it and then you can use it again. Uh, but these pumps usually last for between, you know, five to ten years and in, in some cases 15 or 20 years if you're at a really, really clean vacuum. Is that a, a chemical reaction that you, you get like titanium nitride? Form? It's a lot of different chemical reactions because you have a lot of different molecules in the air, right? So yeah, absolutely, you get uh, titanium nitride, titanium oxides, titanium hydrides, um, so all the, all the different chemicals in the air react to the titanium differently, so you actually do get different pumping rates. So like the pumping rate of oxygen is very high, the pumping rate of hydrogen is very high because those react really quickly with titanium, but the pumping rate of argon is really low, and there still is 1% argon concentration in the atmosphere. So yeah, it, takes, uh, it can take 100 times longer to pump the same amount of argon as it does a, a volume of hydrogen or nitrogen. Um, and isn't, that's a, another thing you got to keep in mind with those pumps sometimes. Um, so anyways, I'm talking about these units, right? Negative threes, negative sixes, right? We have to measure that somehow. So there's a couple of different types of vacuum gauges, and just like vacuum pumps, certain vacuum gauges work at certain pressure levels. Uh, so the first type of gauge we're going to talk about is a thermocouple gauge. So we're going to have our imaginary chamber somewhere. I'm going to draw this really big. In reality, these things are like that tall. Um, so we got a, uh, so we got a, our chamber up here, okay? We've got, this little, we've got a little tube that connects to the chamber, and then we've got the body of our gauge. And the reason this tube is small is it's, it's really short, so it doesn't affect conductance that much, and it makes it, we got a, it has threads on it so you can screw it into the chamber. And so inside of this gauge, there is a heater wire, and there is a temperature sensor, okay? Um, and uh, actually, th this type of gauge, the type of gauge I'm going to draw right now, the temperature sensor is going to touch the heater wire. So what we do is we run an electrical current through the heater wire, and the wire heats up. Now, in atmosphere, at atmospheric pressure, there's a couple of ways you can, you know, heat moves around, right? It can move around through conduction or convection. Uh, so conduction, if, um, you know, if you touch a hot surface with your hands, heat is conducting into your hand, right? Uh, convection, um, uh, what's happening is, let's I'm imagine the wall behind me is hot. Um, the, uh, uh, the air molecules touch the, touch the hot surface, they heat up and they rise. Um, or they just move away from the surface. So the, the, um, and then there's also uh, radiation, so infrared uh, is coming off of the heated surface and you're losing heat that way. So those are the types of, types of ways you can lose heat and atmosphere pressure. So let's take that concepts to vacuum levels now, okay? Um, we, run heat th we run current through this wire, the wire heats up, so it's getting hot. At atmospheric pressure, there's a lot of air molecules surrounding the wire. 
and those air molecules will take heat away from the wire. So uh, the temperature sensor will notice that the wire is a little bit cooler than it might be somewhere else because the air molecules are convecting heat away from that wire. And yeah, there's infrared losses and there's some conductive losses to the side here, but we, we calibrated all the time. We're just paying attention to the convective losses right now. Uh, air molecules taking heat, heat away from the wire. And so what's gonna happen as the pressure drops? There's less air molecules now. And with less air molecules, there's less heat being taken away from the wire. So the wire actually heats up a little bit more because there's less air around it now. And the lower in pressure you get, uh, the more the wire heats up, the more the temperature sensor senses a change in the temperature of the wire, and you can, and the temperature then can be correlated to the vacuum pressure of the sensor. And so a thermocouple gauge, that's what this is called, a, it could use a thermocouple temperature sensor in it, can read from about 760, 760 torr, some atmospheric pressure, down to about the negative three torr range. Um, and so that's, uh, that's the reactor gauges we have on our, or that's the, that's the gauges we have on our reactor. So the, those two numbers in the reactor, the, uh, the pressure, those are measured using this type of gauge. It's measured using how much heat the air molecules are taking away from, uh, from the wire. The uh, next type of gauge we're going to talk about is actually fairly, um, uh, fairly similar to the thermocouple gauge, and this is going to be called a, uh, a Pironi <coughs> gauge. Um, so we got our chamber again. Uh, we got our, and I'm just going to draw it horizontal because it's easier for me to draw it that way. It's called a wet gauge. Pironi. Uh, P i r i n a. Um, I believe. Um, I just abbreviated P i g uh, for Pironi gauge, and that's what the SCM abbreviates it as too. So I work on drill SCM, so that's why I know it as. And the Pironi gauge uh, just has a piece of wire in it. Uh, so wire comes in. It's very skinny, very long, very sensitive. Wire goes back, and then we have a controller over here that connects to it and measures everything about it. And so this, what this gauge is doing is it's sending current for the wire, and the wire is heating up. So kind of similar to the thermocouple gauge in that regard, it, we're going to be using heat again. So once again, you know, less air molecules. It, things can be hotter because there's less air molecules to take the heat away from it. Um, but a property of metal that heats up is that the resistance of the metal changes with temperature. So whereas with the uh, with the thermocouple gauge, we are using a temperature sensor to measure the change. In this case, we are using the metal itself as its own temperature sensor. So what we do is we alternate between running current through the gauge to heat it up, and then measuring the resistance of the gauge uh, to see what, uh, how hot it is. And so by alternating it really quickly, we keep the wire hot and measure it, keep the wire hot and measure it, keep the wire hot and measure it. Um, and so this is, it's similar to a thermocouple gauge, except that uh, this gauge can measure from kind of like, mm, it can sort of measure atmospheric pressure, but it's not very good at it. But once you hit like 400 torr, it's a lot more accurate. And then uh, from 400 torr, it can measure down to the negative, negative five or negative six range. Uh, so it's just more sensitive than a thermocouple gauge, but it's a little bit more expensive because the wire is really sensitive and the controller is a little bit more complicated for it. Um, and that's the type of gauge that the SEM uses most of the time. And um, so now we've got our vacuum gauge. You know, we've gone from atmospheric pressure uh, to negative six-ish six torr range. Um, but we've got to get all the way to ultra high vacuum somehow. So we've got a few more gauges to talk about. So this type of gauge, the next type of gauge, is going to be a penning gauge. It actually functions similar to the ion getter pump we talked about earlier. Once again, chamber. Except this time the chamber's vacuum is a bit higher for the uh, for the ion gauge to start up. Uh, we got the little tube connecting it, and we got the ion gauge body. And then once again, we have a cylinder in the middle of it, connected to a high voltage feed through. We'll apply like 7 kV to it. Um, we've got some metal plates on the side of it, and then we have the big magnets again. So can anyone see where this is going? Uh, this is similar to the ion pump. Um, so this time we're, we're kind of we're measuring it really carefully. So uh, the, uh, the ring in the center ionizes the gas, the gas starts spinning, collides at the edge here. But the thing to remember is that these ions are carrying current with them. Actually, they're carrying current holes because there's a, a when, when you strip the electron off the ion, right, it's now a negative potential. So uh, you, you're moving that negative potential across the gauge, or uh, the positive potential across the gauge. Um, so when it hits the walls of the gauge, it absorbs some current. And we can measure how much current is flowing between this inner electrode and the outside of the gauge. And so let's think about this. If, if we're at like a you know, 10 to the negative 4 pressure, there's going to be quite a few air molecules in the gauge. So there's going to be a lot of current flowing. 
because there's a lot of air molecules to carry that current. Um, but if we go down to like 10 to the negative 9, there's less air molecules inside the gauge now. And with less air molecules inside the gauge, there's less current flowing. Less ions traveling through, so we're measuring less current, and we can measure that. And so we correlate the current of the gauge to the uh, to a calibrated pressure. And now we know, uh, and now, now we can use this, this type of gauge to get from like the negative three-ish range um, all the way to the negative nines or negative tens. Uh, it doesn't work very well up there, but it, it, it does it does work okay. And the reason we can only start we can only turn this gauge on at negative three is if we try to turn this gauge on at atmospheric pressure, the seven thousand volts between the center of the gauge and the outside of the gauge, which is arc over, um, and you know be like a Tesla coil or a plug in a wall socket in and. Having electrical arcs inside this thing isn't going to work very well. And then, you know, from like the uh, zero tor, or like, or like the, the uh, 10 to the zero or 10 to the negative three range, there's just too many air molecules there. And so, yeah, the gauge can technically run, but there's so many air molecules that you're going to uh, cause damage to the gauge too. Because there's going to be so much current, it's going to be <coughs> hitting the walls a lot, it's going to be eroding the walls. So you just don't want to run the gauge at that pressure, even though it could technically measure it. It'll just, it'll, you're just going to be doing damage to it. Would you please write the name of that gauge? Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see here. P. Uh, Penning gauge. Um, these are these are all abbreviated on Microsoft to work on. So, <laughs> um, and you you often hear this referred to as a cold cathode ion gauge as well. It's called cold cathode because it's uh, this part's cold. Um, the next type of gauge looks somewhat similar to this, um, except there's no magnets on it. Um, so we use the same drawing because don't want too many drawings tonight, right? So we apply the high voltage to the center, except this time we heat it up. We we heat the center of it up, and when it's hot, it can cause ion, it can cause um, molecules to ionize easier. And uh, when they ionize easier, uh, we can measure uh, lower pressures. So now a hot cathode ion gauge can measure from the negative six range or negative five range all the way into like the negative 11s and negative 12s. Um, and uh, it's, it's just because we heat the surface up so much that allows us to ionize gas in that, um, in that uh, much, much, much higher pressure regime than the other gauges can. Um, so any questions about how the vacuum gauges work? Uh, we kind of talked about two types of vacuum gauges. We talked about the ones that use temperature. And now we're talking about, and we talked about the ones that use ions. Um, and there's, there's a multitude of other types of uh, vacuum gauges um, that you can use. Uh, there is like turbo molecular drag gauges. Uh, there is Baritron gauges. There, there's all these other effects, and we could be here for literally a day talking about all the different vacuum gauges. But the ones you talked about here are going to be some of the most common you're going to see, and are also the ones we use in our lab. Uh, so it prepares you for our lab. Um, let's see here. It, uh, what's the time, Carl? Time? Yeah. What time is it? Um, we got twenty-two. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about one more oh, thing. I'm sorry, no. We've got two, two. Okay. I'm gonna talk about one more thing then, and then we'll be done. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is gonna kind of this is gonna explain why we're so paranoid about contaminated vacuum systems and why systems take such a long time to pump down. This time we're just going to focus on our we're just going to focus on our chamber, okay? Nice big chamber, okay? Now, uh, what's the air made of? Right now, atmospheric pressure. What's it made of? <coughs> we got nitrogen. We got argon. We got CO two. We got a bunch of other gases. We got, also got oxygen. And there's some water vapor there, right? You know, there's humidity. Um, and so, materials in general, especially metals like they're using vacuum chambers. When atmospheric pressure air touches it, water molecules get stuck to the surface of the chamber. And that's really annoying, actually. Um, so when you work with vacuum enough, you have this concept of like everything being wet. So like to me, every piece of metal in this room, from a vacuum perspective, is now wet. Because it has touched atmospheric pressure with water molecules in it. And the water molecules are forming an atomically thin surface on the part. Um, and when we try to pump down to vacuum, these water molecules are going to slowly come off occasionally, right? You've, you've all seen the demo where you, you, know, you have a glass of water inside a vacuum chamber and you turn the vacuum chamber on, the water starts boiling in the chamber, right? Because the pressure gets so low, uh, you look at the phase diagram of water, you see that the water is going to start to boil because it, 
the, the, the vacuum is literally sucking the molecules out of the water. So the same thing's happening here. The water molecules are being sucked into the chamber by the vacuum. But this happens kind of slowly. And so as you're pumping the chamber down, you may get, there may be zero leaks. You may have nothing coming in from the outside. But it'll, stay, it'll still take a long time to pump down because you're waiting for these water molecules to come off the side of the chamber. Um, and this is why parts in vacuum need to be clean. Because in addition to water molecules, if you take your finger, touch the chamber, now you have oils in the chamber. Or if you leave, use the solvent to clean the chamber, now you have solvents in the chamber. Um, or the, the, anything can contaminate the inside of these chambers, and it takes a really, really long time to come off the surface of these chambers. And remember, the entire wall of this chamber is covered in all these different contaminants. Uh, it takes a long time to pump down. Um, so this isn't that big of a concern, kind of below the negative five range, okay? So below negative five tor, uh, you can usually pump down just fine, and the water vapor is gonna make very much of a difference. Now, if you have like a container of water in the chamber or a bunch of solvent or really heavy contamination on it, yeah, now you're gonna have a problem. But once you start to get beyond that negative four, negative five range and get start higher, all of a sudden this water vapor becomes the primary thing you're pumping out. Um, so all these big fancy turbo pumps, all these big fancy ion pumps and whatnot, they're all being used to get the water vapor off the chamber walls. And um, if we wanna get beyond negative eight tor, or negative seven really, um, you can, it, it, it will take weeks to months to years to do that if you just do it at room temperature. Like, the, you will not pump down. Um, which kind of sucks, like we, we want to be able to pump our systems down. So what we do is once again we apply really big heaters to the outside of all parts of our chamber. And so what happens is uh, we heat the entire chamber up to somewhere between 200 degrees Celsius and 400 degrees Celsius. And just like uh, water uh, evaporates faster or boils um, at atmospheric pressure when you heat it up, the same thing happens to all these water molecules and oil molecules and everything in the chamber. The heat drives the molecules off of the wall and out of the walls of the chamber and into the vacuum. So the vacuum pressure in this type of chamber, uh, we're gonna, um, uh, the, the x-axis is gonna be time, okay, the y-axis is gonna be uh, pressure. So we start with atmospheric pressure, we turn our rocking pump on, Ruffin pump pumps, 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 <coughs> pumps. It gets down to the negative three range, right? Ruffin pump stops working because they can't get past the negative three. Then we need to turn on our next pump. Our next pump can be a, a, a turbo molecular pump or an oil diffusion pump. We turn on our oil diffusion pump, it spins up or heats up, pressure falls again. It's going to fall pretty quickly through, like, through the negative three, through the negative four, through the negative five. We're going to fall pretty quickly. And then we're going to kind of slowly flatten out. And if we let it run, it will eventually get down to where it needs to go to an extent, um, but we're still gonna have some problems with that. And uh, that's because now, at this point, we are dealing with the water vapor coming out of the chamber. So what we do, we turn the heaters on, and what's gonna happen when I turn the heaters on in the chamber? I'm gonna start driving all the molecules out off the chamber walls. What changes? Pressure's, pressure's exactly, pressure's gonna increase. So we turn the heaters on, pressure starts to increase. But as the pressure's increasing, we're getting rid of all this contamination. So pressure is increasing for a while, and then heaters are still on. Pressure will kind of slowly start to fall. And then once we fall back down below where we originally started, we can turn the heaters off. And even though the pressure is not where we want it yet, we can still turn the heaters off. And now that we turn the heaters off, what's going to happen? What? Yeah. Exactly. And the reason the pressure goes down is we stop desorbing the molecules from there. So you turn the heaters off, and you get a pretty quick decrease in pressure. And now you're at your base pressure. Uh, so that's kind of the, that's kind of the pumping curve. That's, that's the pumping curve. We'll say all the way to the ultra high vacuum range uh, for the reactor and the SCM we have. It pretty much stops here, and that's because we only have a rotary pump and a molecular pump. We don't have any sort of ion pumps on the, on the systems we have here. Uh, but you start working on any sort of bigger system, and you will. Yeah. We do have a cold trap. Give me to draw the cold trap too. I'm just. It, it's okay. A, yeah, so, that's, so the cold trap's another type of getter pump. Um, actually, before I do that, are there any questions about the pump down curve or how this happens or what's going on here with the pressure changes over time? We good? Okay. So a cold trap is another type of pump. It's a getter pump. So uh, thinking, so getter pump, what, is, what, what does a getter pump mean? What, type of, what does that do? <coughs> I'm going to start picking people if you don't raise your hands. 
You've already answered a lot of questions. What's it get a pump to? It gets the ions. Uh, it doesn't necessarily get ions. It has the types of pumps I drew. Uh, remember, one of, the, one of the pumps did, the ion get a pump did, but the non evaporable get a pump, those just pieces of metal sitting there, those gases weren't ionized. They were just floating out. Yeah, so it just gets molecules. So the cold trap's another type of pump. Um, we don't really use it very often because we don't need to, but we can. Uh, it's on the reactor. So we've got our chamber. And then in the chamber, uh, we've got a vessel of liquid nitrogen. So like, we'll pour liquid nitrogen from the top here. Yeah, we've just got a large chunk of metal sitting there. Um, it's that liquid nitrogen temperatures, okay? So when an air molecule comes along in the chamber and it touches the pump, the pump's so cold it sticks to the pump, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, so all the air molecules just stick to the pump. Now this doesn't this doesn't work nearly as well when it's just when it's just bare metal. Um, as a as an ion pump, it doesn't it, it can't get down to that lower pressure, but it does get us from like with our reactor, it can get us from like the negative five, negative six range. It can take us into the negative sevens, or negative eights by using that, that cold trap. And there's a couple other reasons to use the cold trap relating to contamination and backstreaming and stuff. We'll, we'll go that's that's a more advanced topic, so we'll cover that later. Um, but these these cold trap or uh, <coughs> these, these cold trap or cryo pumps can actually be used to get to the negative twelves and negative thirteen ranges. And the way you do that is you cover the surface in a carbon material that really, really, really likes to absorb air molecules when it's cold. So now, instead of the air molecules just hitting the pump, um, just hitting the metal of the pump, it hit this uh, cryo-getter material, and when it hits the cryo-getter material, it just gets stuck, and it just stays there. And so getter pumps are, or uh, uh, cryo-pumps are another type of getter pump, and they're very, very fast, and can get you to low vacuum. Um, the problem is you have to have it constantly cool down, and so you're either constantly pouring liquid nitrogen into it, or you're using um, helium cryo compressors, which are loud, noisy, and expensive. Yeah? Are you going to get condensation of your water vapor on that? Uh, the water vapor just freezes on it, but yeah, this type of pump you don't you don't use below uh, like negative three or negative four before you even cool the pump down. And so once again, there's just so few air molecules here. These pumps can operate for years just absorbing air molecules out of the vacuum. Uh, that that's it, it's weird. It, it, it's weird to think about how long these pumps can just absorb molecules into the surface of them, but the pressures we're dealing with are just so low and there's so few air molecules that this type of thing works. Um, I wish I had some example of, you know, like, if you had a ping pong ball in the middle of a stadium for the air molecules, I, I don't have a good math for that, but it's basically the most extreme version of that you could think of. Um, we're talking, we can, like, count the number of air molecules in a cubic, in, in, in a volume at this pressure, whereas you know, um, uh, if you know uh, how many molecules are in a mole, what is it? Uh, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. There we go, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Well, you knock, um, you know, uh, 15 orders of magnitude off that. Uh, that gets a lot fewer molecules. Um, and 15 orders of magnitude, you know the difference between atmospheric pressure and uh, 10 to the negative uh, 12? Yeah, 10 to the negative 12 uh, tor, so. Um, uh, real briefly, these are the units you'll see occasionally. You might see it in Pascal's. Uh, Pascal's are written very similarly to Tor. It's just a different unit. I don't remember the conversion off the top of my head. It's kind of annoying to do in scientific notation, but it's 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 negative something Pascal's now. It's a negative something Tor. It's just another unit. Um, you'll see inches of mercury sometimes, um, but inches of mercury isn't useful really below a certain pressure, so we don't really touch it at all. Um, Let's see here. Anything else I'm missing? <coughs> atmospheres. Atmosphere. Yeah, of course, atmospheres. Um, so one atmosphere is equivalent to 760 torr, but uh, talking about atmospheres when you're at such a high vacuum really quickly stops to make sense. Um, so we use other units that are uh, defined slightly differently. So, um, and it, you, yeah, you, you could technically measure this in atmosphere, but nobody does. 